well. If it isn't, if it isn't my comrades. If it isn't us, here we are again, together, in another one of these. Uh, this one's criticizing religion, I think, two, yeah. Uh, and I want to talk about this concept of a spiritual daddy, for, for lack of a better word. And it's being especially, not especially, but definitely derogatory towards religion. So I'm going to relish in that part as well. Um, but uh, this might, you know, lean on the little bit of the farther side of things. And uh, I got a little bit of notes for this one, too. So hopefully we'll keep that all together. Uh, it's your boy. It's your OG Trotsky Wrangler here. Welcome back to another jog video, my comrades. Today we're going to talk about a very convenient, but not so convenient quality, about spirituality. Mostly with religions who have figures in their theism. Whether monotheistic or polytheistic, these divine forces are seen as extra-dimensional beings to appeal to, to give rituals to, to sacrifice things to, in order to acquire something. It would never be conducted strictly for the sake of it. All religions' actions justify themselves by their own belief system's necessitation, self-necessitation. Uh, self uh, in other words, you don't just do a religious rite for no purpose. It has a purpose to appeal to the gods or God or serve as an exchange for something. Uh, even if it is based in some kind of reverence towards the universe, that action still has utility, which brings um, a type of yield uh, to that doer of the action that inherently gives it this quality of, uh, you know, uh, like... What a ritual or sacrifice to do. Um, this behavior is indicative of this spiritual daddy uh, quality. I'm, you know, ascribed to all spiritualities, but I'm really trying to get at here. Um, you know, it's that if you just believe, follow the rules, do your rites and sacrifices, you will be protected. You will join the heavenly place in the afterlife or be given a good existence in the next life. Uh, this is all cope. There is no escape from death. Death is, from what our best knowledge is at the moment, a eternal dreamless sleep, as I believe Socrates was the one to first, uh, you know, not first do it, because we love that white man history stuff, but, um, you know, one of these, like, notable figures in white world history, um, in Greek empire, and this notable figure. Um, so why, why are people so caught up in this pursuit of what, you know, seems like trying to protect themselves in death by not just doing all these behaviors and rituals and, and sacraments and sacrifices, but just everything that uh, comes with the package of being a part of said spirituality. Um, this kind of like uh, color or version of, uh, you know, um, imagination or fantasy to believe in it. it of course, you know, also, you can't forget as either that this heavenly place is not proven, nor is reincarnation proven, as its definition exists in its traditional way. And all belief in this otherworldly quality of existence and afterlife is merely speculation and hope. Nothing of this is proven at all. All of it is asking people to do all of these things and still hope and have faith that it'll all work out, that it'll all have... Um, what they think uh, will work out for them and will give them the benefit and peace that they seek, that they can't get out of uh, considering the lack of the, you know, the, the idea of their own ending of existence in life. Almost all adherence to any of these belief systems thereby create this duality of their life, conscious or not. Uh, for them, life is fundamentally promised continuity in some fashion after their deaths. This consolation prize and a token for their faith, for their pain of existence, not only serves as a protective existential blanket to keep away the cold of introspection, but also creates less of a call for the person to create a better place to live here on Earth. Now, at first, first uh, surface value, for you know, first look at this, it may seem like that's not necessarily true. That it might actually be the opposite, right? that a, a spiritual person, a religious person, would actually have more of an incentive to change the world, right? They would be more motivated, right? Because they're trying to be more morally inclined or more, you know, what their idea is of a good person, right? To try to do better. However, what you see um, more often than not, pretty almost unequivocally, is um, all of these communities, all of these belief systems, all of these spiritualities believe in a pacifism or a peace or a, an acceptance with the universe, and a, a unity with the universe that seeks harmony, oneness, 
Uh, rarely do you see any religion justify, let's say, revolutionary violence against the state or suggest that it's within any person's right to liberate themselves from any type of oppression that their uh, the, the bindings of life give them to uh, or, you know, put them under. Uh, they all advocate for some kind of way of, um, you know, making the best of life, coming to terms with things, finding inner peace and finding, you know, what it means to be content and calm. And rarely do you see any of these spiritual pursuits actually interested in, like, the conflicts of life, the struggles of life, the frictions. Um, and this is just another aspect of religion where it claims to be so asp uh, absolute and total, but it absolutely falls through um, every time. But more so just um, kind of enumerating that it's not um, the degree it with which some things in life r will require... Um, severe like resistance against in order to change cannot coexist with the um, peace prophesizing the peace um, you know I mean it's 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 pro status quo reconciliation there's not um, any interest in actually trying to change these things and look at uh, different you know none of these systems or beliefs ideas would ever be willing to consider that they are wrong right it's all they're all inherently true with what they do and when people believe in this stuff they can feel a lot more comfortable about what's you know this imaginary fairy tale land in death that um just on even a subconscious level can just quell even the smallest bit of any revolutionary urge and angered urge right because we can just create another uh, villainization of the emotion of anger which is another phenomenon you see in spirituality um you don't i i, I never come across spiritual people who are are like pro anger like be in touch with your and therapists are people who are like professionally trained to help you feel better people who are like um, closer in life when they're like trying to help you with stuff and you know maybe you're afflicted with something and they're like yeah you should be mad you know but when it comes to actual the religion religion the, what it's supposed to be good at, it can't it can't follow through when people believe in this afterlife stuff it can give you any person a type of comfort a peace that they don't actually have to do whatever it takes in this life to make things better that no matter what as long as they do the the play the little spiritual game here that they'll be they'll be set for you know uh, eternity what in their minds after death uh, which of course is all of this is under the imagination of someone who's alive right nobody believes in the afterlife who's dead all of us who believe in us are alive every single person who believes in this that there's life after death is is speculating it's it's pure conjecture there's no you would have to be dead to know for sure that it's true um and this this duality this binary this splitting of existence that inherently happens by this kind of weird um you know idealization causes this neutering of potential revolutionary violence that may sit in any person to rise above and do better you know, the way this exists most potently is within the sleeping portion of the working class members afraid of revolutionary violence. And many religious folks are pacifists or peace seeking, like I said, and rarely also, as I said, especially in the second modern millennia, do you see religious or spiritual individuals advocate for conflict and violence against their oppressors? Never. You never see that. Do you not instead come across the religious telling you to accept things as they are, to learn to go with the flow of the universe, to not take a life or cause harm? On the surface, noble pursuits of peace underneath impotent passivity. Somebody like Nietzsche criticizes this as slave morality, but that's a video for another day. Uh, in short, what reason would supersede a religious intention to be on the good side of the universe and death if violence would threaten that? Once again, entirely make-believe, post-death peace. There's no point that any, there's nothing, if the promise of eternal life, which is, you know, like the biggest deal to most of these people, right, is always on the table, what incentive is there for anyone to commit, you know, revolutionary violence for, for the betterment of others? I just ask where this discussion for theologies in favor of liberation and revolution is. So much of these spiritual communities do good, and that's steel manning their influence. Plenty of religious influence is corrosive and toxic. It's only 
in favor of perpetuating the status quo, trying to fix a system that was always meant to be broken, where only one true action can really take place to stop it once and for all. While spiritual revolutionaries exist, they are not religious or spiritual norm. Why would any spiritual person be compelled in every atom of their being to change the world so long as the promise of life after death comforts their strongest fears? There's no reason. Uh, let me know what you think. Take care. Probably continue more of this in the next one. Take it easy. Thanks again for listening. Be well. Adios.